Hi everyone, this is Heather. I want to welcome you to the CCRN practice quiz. Each slide will remain up for 40 seconds. Then it will automatically advance to the answer slide. Uh, please pause it if you need more time to read the question. And on the answer slide, you will hear my voice going over the rationale. Um, I hope you enjoy practicing and I wish you the best of luck on your journey to CCRN and I want you to know that you can do this. So the answer is C, hemodialysis. So you have to pay really close attention to words in these questions. They use two words that would clue you into what the correct answer was in this scenario. They use the word stable and they use the word Crohn's disease. So why do I say Crohn's disease would have kind of tipped you off? Um, you probably already know this, but uh, D, peritoneal dialysis, is contraindicated with Crohn's disease. And choices A and B are for the unstable patient, whereas C is the gold standard for the stable patient. Um, if you are wondering what the difference between hemofiltration is and what dialysis is, Hemofiltration uses convection so they can use or they can move larger and smaller particles while hemodialysis uses diffusion to move particles. And the answer is B. Uh, because during intrarenal acute renal failure, BUN and creatinine levels are elevated above normal, but they're close uh, to a 10 to 1 BUN creatinine ratio. Uh, urine osmolality is decreased and urine sodium is increased. Chronic renal failure has a normal urine osmolality and elevated urine sodium until end-stage renal failure. Um, during your pre-renal acute renal failure, the urine osmolality is higher than 400, and the urine sodium is less than 10 mL equivalents per liter. Uh, BUN and creatinine would not be this elevated in renal insufficiency. The BUN creatinine ratio is closer to 20 to 1 during pre-renal acute renal failure.
So the answer for this one is C. Recommend placement of a small bowel feeding tube because of repeated high residual volumes. Um, when you're looking at this one, you know, they're asking what the nurse should do in this situation. So let's look at each of the options here. We have A that says withhold the feeding and resume when residual volume is less than 250 milliliters. Um, it does not mention when to resume it. It doesn't say when to recheck it. it. It's not very specific at all, and it's probably just not a very good answer. Uh, B, return the residual, place the tube feeding on hold, and recheck in four hours. Well, even if you look at our uh, gastric feeding protocol, well, the one that was in forms fast at least, uh, we would, if we had high residuals, check it again in two hours, just so we could closely monitor that. Um, and C, of course, is the answer, and I, you know, we talked about that a little bit, um, but, you know, we know that if you get a feeding tube, uh, you know, deep down in the gut, or beyond the ligament of trites, um, that this is better for patients who have uh, persistent intolerance to their feedings or documented aspiration. Um, so if uh, the patient, you know, remains intubated and or the assessment reveals, you know, a high gastric residual volume or GRV, then, you know, the next step is to place a small bowel feeding tube. Um, responses A and B, again, you know, they're talking about withholding the feeding, but repeated withholding of nutritional support in the critically ill patient has the potential for not meeting demands and creating a deficit. Uh, response D sets the patient up for potential aspiration if the GRV is allowed to accumulate in the stomach. So, you know, so you've got your last residual was high and then you're not going to check it again for another four when you know the last two were high. Yeah, so a lot can happen in that four hours. The best thing to do is C. So the answer for this one is B, reduction of core temperature to 33 degrees Celsius for 12 to 24 hours. This is the only uh, answer choice here that answers the question which intervention would be most beneficial in preventing neurologic impairment. A, C, and D would all be done, but B is specific to neurologic recovery after cardiac arrest. Uh, you know, treatment after acute coronary symptoms and after cardiac arrest include minimizing lung injury, supporting the organ function, and reducing the risk of multi-organ injury. Um, but the question really, you know, you, you have to look at your stem. They're asking about neurological impairment. What's the most beneficial for that?
The answer is A. Switch your normal saline to D5 half normal saline. And you're thinking, I've got a patient with DKA and I'm putting them on dextrose. What? Well, you kind of have to look at the whole picture here. Um, so you had a blood sugar that was 475 and now your blood sugar is 227. It's quite a drop, it's quite significant, and you can anticipate that your next blood sugar is going to be in the tank. So I would say, and you guys probably see this on the floor a lot, that they do put the patients in DKA on the D5. Um, and B, decrease the insulin infusion by two units an hour, really. So you probably have it on like 20 or something because, you know, they're DKA, right? So only decreasing it by two probably would not be beneficial um, and wouldn't really serve much of a purpose. Um, C, give an amp of sodium bicarbonate. Well, so what's your last pH on here? Your last pH on here is 7.32. I don't think that we would give a whole amp of bicarb for that. Uh, in addition, you know, they may possibly even be on a bicarb drip, but most certainly with that pH, they would not need any sodium bicarb. Uh, D is add potassium chloride to IV fluids. Uh, the potassium in this scenario is 4.2, which is within normal limit. So the best answer in this case is A. Um, Evidence-based practice treatment for DKA is fluid replacement, uh, administration of IV insulin, monitoring and treating acidosis and electrolyte imbalances. Once the glucose level reaches 250, the normal saline infusion should be changed to D5 half normal saline to prevent cerebral edema. Glucose is very osmotic and once the shift of glucose into the cell occurs, the water will enter the cell as well. Infusing fluids with glucose helps to prevent cerebral edema by cutting sodium to reduce fluid accumulation as well as giving some glucose to draw it and water out of cells. Um, glucose levels should not be lowered more than 100 milligrams per deciliter per hour. And in three hours, it has decreased from 475 to 277, or 227, sorry. So B would not be correct uh, therapy. This patient may have required sodium bicarb, uh, but it does not require any more now because the acidosis is resolving. Um, and again, adding potassium would be contraindicated because the level is within a normal range. The answer is B, maintain ICP less than 20, treat elevated body temperature, aggressive management of pain and anxiety. We can all picture this patient in our surgical trauma ICU or in our STICU. The lights are all off, the nurse is the gatekeeper of the door, they're keeping visitors to a minimum, they're keeping conversation to a minimum, they're keeping lights to a minimum, everything on the minimum um, because the stimulation of the patient is not good for their ICP especially in the early stages like they see it over there in STICU. 
If you look at choices A, C, and D, you can look at those and systematically eliminate them. Um, a talks about hyperventilating the patient. And if you know anything about what happens with hyperventilation, it causes vasoconstriction. So the vasoconstriction causes elevated ICP, not decreased. ICP. Uh, choice C talks about the CPP being less than 20. Uh, we actually with CPP want to see it greater than 60 because we're talking about a perfusion pressure here. CPP, if you don't know um, how to calculate that, it is the mean arterial pressure minus your ICP. So it kind of gives you a picture of how is the brain perfusing. So if it's less than 20, uh, it is poorly perfused. And it is also associated with uh, poor outcomes with the TBI patient. If you look at level or question D, it talks about keeping the glucose between 150 and 200. Now, why on earth do you need to keep your sugar elevated with this patient? You don't. Um, there is no reason this patient can't have a normal glucose. Their glucose does not need to be elevated. Uh, in order to facilitate proper healing, we want the glucose to be normal, not elevated. The answer on this one is D. The body regulates at acid-base balance through the buffer system. The loss of metabolic acids, chloride, potassium, or both through diuresis can ultimately lead to a metabolic al alkalosis. The renal buffer system activates more slowly and may take up to two days to regulate acid base imbalance. Uh, response A is an example of respiratory acidosis with partial metabolic compensation. Uh, B is a respiratory alkalosis with a partial metabolic compensation. C is a metabolic acidosis with partial respiratory compensation. So if you're not really strong on blood gases, I can help you with that. Um, there's six steps that you can use uh, for an easy ABG analysis. Step one, you want to look at your pH. If it is below 7.35, it's acidic. If it is above 7.45, it's alkalotic. Um, step two, look at your CO2. Normal CO2 is 35 to 45. Below 35, is alkalotic, above 45 is acidic. Um, so it's kind of the exact opposite of what pH is. Then you want to analyze your bicarb. So a normal bicarb is 22 to 26. Um, if the bicarb is below 22, it's acidotic, which kind of mirrors your pH. If the bicarb is above 26, the patient is alkalotic. Okay, so as you're doing each of this, so let's say, you know, your, your pH was acidic, you should write acidic. Your CO2 is 
acidic, you're right, acidic. Okay, so label each of these as you look at them. Um, step four, match the CO2 or the sodium bicarb with the pH. Um, so if the pH is acidotic and the CO2 is acidotic, then the acid uh, base disturbance is being caused by what? By the respiratory system. Yeah. Um, so if the pH is alkalotic and your bicarb is alkalotic, then it's being caused by yep your metabolic system or renal system. So you would have a metabolic alkalosis. Um, so step five, does the CO2 or bicarb go the opposite direction of the pH? Um, so if it does, there is compensation by that system. So for example, let's say your pH is acidotic, your CO2 is acidotic, but your HCO3 or bicarb is alkalotic. The CO2 matches the pH, making the primary acid-base disorder respiratory acidosis. Um, if the bicarb is opposite of the pH, then it would be evidence of a compensation from your metabolic system. So you would have a respiratory acidosis with uh, metabolic compensation, right? Okay. So let's let's do an example, and I'm sure I've lost somebody at this point, but that is okay. So if you have a pH that is 7.27, it is acidotic. Yeah. Right, because it's below that 7.35. If your CO2 is 53, acidotic, very good, yes. Uh, if the CO2 is greater than 45, that's acidotic. Um, your PO2 is 50, that is low. Your O2 sat is 79%, that is low, and your bicarb is 24. So 22 to 26 is normal, so 24 is normal, so what do we have here? What do we have? Yeah, I bet you already got it, if you haven't already shut it off. <laughs> You have a respiratory acidosis with hypoxemia. So this patient um, has an acute respiratory disorder. Okay, so let's do another one. Okay, so your pH is 7.52. Your CO2 is 29. Your PO2 is 100. Your O2 sat is 98%, and your bicarb is 23. So your pH is 7.52, which is alkalotic. Your CO2 is 29, so this is alkalotic, right? So your CO2 is um, less than 35, and that means it's alkalotic. <coughs> um, your PO2 is 100, and that is normal. O2 sat is 98%, and that is normal too. And your bicarb was 23, and that is normal. Yeah, normal. So this is a respiratory alkalosis. Yes. Respiratory alkalosis, and what is a good cause of that? Uh, that would be hyperventilating, so the patient is hyperventilating.
Okay, well, so that's just a little tutorial on the blood gases, but if you want something more in depth, um, you know, let me know. Uh, just remember that six step approach, I, you know, I find it really helpful. Thanks. Hi guys, so the answer on this one is B. Everything for this patient is decreased. Uh, PEEP can decrease cardiac output by impeding venous return, which decreases right and subsequently left ventricular stroke volume. Uh, support of breathing usually relieves work of breathing and reverses hypercapnia, uh, acidemia, and hypoxemia. The combination of relief of work, of breathing, and improved oxygenation and ventilation often leads to profound and sudden decrease in sympathetic stimulation, heart rate, and blood pressure to the cardiovascular system. Um, and the other thing, if you think about this, I mean, so the patient has heart failure, their heart is failing, right? and they have viral pneumonia which some of you guys probably thought because of the viral pneumonia that their heart rate would be increased but the underlying and significant disease the patient has is heart failure and generally we see in heart failure a decreased heart rate and a decreased blood pressure uh, I think we've all seen the patient on the unit who is on a dopamine drip for days and has an EF of 10% um, because they have a weak pump, they don't generate much of a blood pressure, and they don't generate much of a heart rate either. So when your heart rate and your blood pressure are down, your cardiac output will be down as well as your stroke volume. Um, I don't know if that's too simple, but I mean, if you kind of look at heart failure and the disease in and of itself, um, you know, these things would be decreased.